Morphemes can also have allomorphs. So we saw that a phoneme can have many allophones. You can have two sounds which are allophones of the same phoneme. That meant that if I have two sounds and I switched one for the other, it wouldn't change the meaning. Um, whereas separate phonemes, if I have these two sounds on a separate phoneme, changing one for the other would change the meaning. We have this relationship too with morphemes. So a morpheme would be kind of a category of possible pronunciations, a group of possible pronunciations which has a single meaning. And these would be strings of pronunciation. We're not talking about single sounds anymore. And one morpheme could have more than one allomorph. So if I changed out one allomorph for the other, it wouldn't change the meaning of the word, but it might sound strange. Um, if I said something like, instead of saying offensive, I said offendive. Um, or if I said offenser instead of offender, um, I'm using the wrong pronunciation for that morpheme, offend, which has two pronunciations, offend or offense. People would be able to retrieve what morpheme I meant, what morpheme I wanted to say, but it's two different pronunciations of that same morpheme. If I have strings of sounds that are separate morphemes, that means that if I switched one out for the other one, it would be a brand new meaning. Uh, it would totally change it. So walks versus walked, if I switched out the s for the t, walks, walked, s is not just a different allomorph of that morpheme, same morpheme, I don't know what it would even mean. Um, s is the morpheme, which means third person, singular, present tense. D is the morpheme, which means past tense. And switching them out would show that these are two totally different morphemes. They're not just different pronunciations of the same one. The, a great example, kind of the classic example for this in English, is this S. Um, and S does a couple different things for us in English. We can make it be a plural if it attaches to a noun. It's like cat, cats. It could also be third person singular present tense if I attach it to a verb. Walk, walks. Run, runs. Um, and what are the pronunciations that I have? Well, it can be pronounced as s or as z or as is, right? I can have walk, walks, run, runs, or wish, wishes. Um, so s, z, or is. And the same sort of idea, it's this underlying plural suffix, this plural morpheme, can have those three different pronunciations. And it turns out that the phonology, the sounds, actually interact with the morphology that change the pronunciation of this morpheme itself and kind of create different allomorphs. So we actually have a morpheme rule. And just like phonemes, we saw rules that would say the phoneme, whatever, in a single bracket could have one pronunciation, could be pronounced as this allophone in a certain environment or as a different allophone in a different environment. Same thing here. So the morpheme will have one pronunciation in one environment and the same morpheme could have a different pronunciation in a different environment. So the morpheme s, which is the English plural morpheme, um, has a, one pronunciation. I can pronounce it as is. And I pronounce it as is if it follows any of these four sounds. S, z, sh, z. And because sh, z, it would also follow ch, j. Um, so you could say he buses the kids. You could say the plane buzzes the fields. Um, you could say he pushes the cards. You could say he judges um, the situation. So after any of those four sounds, it will be pronounced as is. If it occurs after any voiceless consonant, it will be pronounced as s. So walk ends with k. Um, so it will be walks. Uh, wait ends in t. A voiceless consonant will be waits. Um, if it follows any voiced consonant or actually a vowel, right, because vowels are also voiced, any voice sound, it will be pronounced as z. So go, goes, um, bud, buds, um, run, runs. So all of those end in a voiced sound. But we also have these weird ways of pronouncing this plural morpheme in English. After the word ox, I don't usually say oxes. I would normally think it would be is because ox ends with the sound s. But there is this weird pronunciation which can be used to say oxen. And there's an even rarer situation. Normally I would say brothers because er is voice, it would be z. But there is this older form where brethren, um, which would eventually then be pronounced as brethren, is possible. 
This plural morpheme could have one allomorph of e in the word antennae, so it seems like it only has this pronunciation e when it attaches to a few weird uh, feminine Latin roots. We have this weird Greek plural that the, the plural of genus is genera. Uh, it's a very strange one. So the green ones here depend on the phonology, and these would be regular. Native speakers would be totally unaware of this, and native speakers would never have to be taught this. They would automatically, no matter what new word came into language, apply this rule automatically. We saw we have a new alien, a zaxor. So how would I pronounce this plural s if I put it at the end of zaxor? Well, because r is a voice sound, it would be zaxorz. Um, I wouldn't ever say zaxorin or zaxori. I can't do this. These are irregular forms. This is a form where it's unpredictable. It's totally unpredictable. It's an allomorph of that morpheme, but it depends on what, what specific morpheme it attaches to. You see these green ones are phonological considerations. These blue ones are lists of other morphemes. And this would need to be taught specifically. We would expect native speakers to make these kinds of mistakes all of the time. And irregularity depends actually on the history. So learning in a regular past tense or in a regular plural, it's a strange form of allomorphy that you would have to memorize. Once you learned the word ox, you would have to memorize that its plural is oxen and not oxes as you would expect. Or antenna is not antennas as you would expect, it's antennae. This raises the question whether histories of these words get stored in the lexicon. I said that irregularity is a result of historical processes. And if I'm a learned person, I might be able to think of, oh yeah, I never realized that. There's some sort of relationship, or I bet that this word actually came from somewhere else. And like that, that, what you can figure out by really reflecting or thinking hard about a morpheme pattern, that actually might be true, that it reflects some kind of a historical fact. There's a historical reason that the past tense of sing is sang, or that the plural of geese is, or goose, that the plural of goose is geese. But remember, most native speakers are unconscious of these sorts of historical patterns. Morphemes are gonna forget their history as they're acquired by new generation. Babies just know what they heard. They don't know what their great-grandparents said, what their great-great-great-grandparents said. So a baby only acquires a language as it's used in that moment. A baby never acquires a language with all of its history attached. A great example of this would be a morpheme which used to exist in English, hap. So hap would meant something like chance or fortune, um, good fortune. So a hap e person, we saw this e morpheme, like sleepy, this e ending. A hap e person was a person who had lots of hap. That meant that they were full of fortune, um, full of chance. A hap less person was someone who had no good fortune, um, so they were missing it. Hap in would be a verb like to cause fortune to come into existence. The same way that we have a word like black in, which would mean to make something black or shorten to make something short. Happen would be to make something happy, um, to make something have fortune. And mishap, miss like misbehavior um, or mistake. Um, miss meant something like bad or unfortunate. So mishap would be actually bad fortune or bad chance. Um, but this is something that no speaker of English would actually know. It's not true that happy to an English speaking baby today even though historically we could point back way at a time, maybe in the 15th century, where English speakers would have thought, oh, this is made up of two morphemes. It's clearly made of hap plus e. But nowadays, everyone would say happy is completely in indivisible because hap has no meaning on its own. So it's just a single morpheme, happy. Same thing with happen. No English speaker today would think happen is made up of two morphemes, hap plus this suffix n, which means to make something an adjective. No, people would think of happen as being just a single verb that you can't divide any further. Its meaning is completely unpredictable. So happy and happen would be single entries in a speaker's lexicon. They wouldn't be stored as multiple morphemes. So what are the morphemes here in these words? In the word electron, we can see that there's this electra part and is there is a morpheme in English, on, which seems to mean particle, like neutron, photon, ion, gluon, boson. So maybe it's electro plus on, which means particle. There is actually a kind of a 
morpheme tron that we see sometimes in English, which sort of means like a machine. Maybe neutron is made up of nu plus tron instead of neut and on. We have like megatron, gravitron. I could have a mathatron, which would be like a robot that does math, I guess, or a drinkatron or a shopatron. So it seems to mean robot or machine these days. So maybe the word electron is made of some morpheme elec plus some morpheme tron. So we've got three different hypotheses. Either electron is a single morpheme, which just means this electrically charged particle. It could be electro plus another morpheme on. So electra itself could mean this electricity and then on could mean particle. Or maybe I could have elec mean something and tron means a machine. Well, that one doesn't seem to make sense because there's no machine or anything kind of involved in an electron. Let's look at some more pieces of data. I have electric. So this ick ending is something that can attach to a noun to create an adjective. So acid, acidic, nomad, nomadic. So maybe that's this ick. Maybe it's electra plus this ick, which means taking this noun, whatever electra would mean, plus an ick. Electrify, so ify means to take a noun and to have a verb that means to create that noun or bring that noun into existence. So humid or an adjective, I guess, here. Sanct, sanctify would be to make holy, humid, humidify. So if I does seem to mean something like to make it into this thing, if I had dork, dorkify, I'm going to dorkify you or undorkify you. It means like to make you not this adjective or to make you not this noun. Again, we'd have this electro plus this a phi, which mean a verb, a verb to make this electricity exist. Uh, electrical, again, we have this ul morpheme. We had this ick already. Um, neutral, tonal, I can attach ul to tone and make tonal. Um, electricality, um, we have this idi, humidity, um, nationality. So electricality is maybe made of electro plus ick, al, and iti. Um, electricity, there's that a T again. I could just put it straight on to electric, which is this a T in neutrality or totality. Um, and then yin, like electrician, <laughs> um, which could be pronounced electrician or electrician. Um, so the question is, is this black thing its own morpheme or is there a single morpheme which is the black plus the red together? I guess we would want to say that there is this blue morpheme, ify, or this green morpheme, ol, or this green morpheme, yun, because it attaches to lots of words. But is there a morpheme electric, or is there a morpheme elect? Well, historically, if we look back, we can understand this pattern. Elect was a morpheme in Greek, which meant amber, and you rubbed amber to get electricity, so that's what it came to mean. So these are all Greek roots here. That would make sense. They would attach... Or, these are all Greek endings, which would attach to that Greek root. But no English-speaking baby is going to know that there used to be this root electra, which meant amber. So probably English-speaking babies these days and English-speaking learners, or English learners, would need to learn electric as a single morpheme, and then electron as another morpheme, and maybe electrify as another morpheme. Um, because there is no real morpheme elect. Who's, who could exist on its own or whose meaning is actually predictable. So what role should etymology like this, so the study of etymology, play as we're teaching our learners new morphemes or teaching our learners new words? Well, some teachers do find it helpful to use etymology. Um, these not quite morphemes, like the elect and electricity or elect and electrical, um, it might be worth it if you had really educated learners who seemed clever and liked learning that way. You could point out, hey, there's this Greek word amber that, you know, is that is that root in all of those things. So anytime you see anything with electric, it has something to do with electricity or charge. Um, you might even have it as a helpful mnemonic device like butterfly. Historically, it was a kind of fly, and because the wing scales, if you rubbed them, the yellow would sort of come off on your finger. It looks like butter, but you don't have to know that story in order to learn what a butterfly is, and, and English-speaking babies certainly don't. They just learn the word butterfly until maybe one day it dawns on them all of a sudden, oh, that's made of butter plus fly. I never even thought about that. Or a word like undertake. 
Um, undertake basically means to do, and it used to literally mean in some much older form of the Germanic language, like I'm going to pick something heavy up and put it up on my shoulders to carry it. So I'm going to undertake this thing, like I'm going to take myself under it and bring it around. But nowadays it just means to start something or to do something. So the historical meaning of this is really of not much use to native speakers, but as a teacher, if I told that story in an evocative way, it might help them remember what that word means. But we just have to keep in mind that childhood acquired learners, so babies, have no knowledge of etymology, no knowledge of the history of the words. They do just fine. So we don't need to teach the etymology to our learners, especially if it becomes more confusing. One little last side note on this. So we saw in that data with electricity, electrify, electrician, electricality, that we spell it all with a C, even though it has all these different pronunciations. C is pronounced as K in electric. C is pronounced as SH in electrician. C is pronounced as S in electricity. Um, we can see that in the word apostle, I don't pronounce this T. In the word apostolic, I do pronounce the T. In the word apostyle, I do pronounce the T. So even though I don't pronounce it an apostle, I still write it. Or bam, there's no B at the end. Bombing, there's no B. But And bomber, there's no B. Yet bombardment, now I do pronounce this B. Bombardier, I do pronounce this B. Produce, productive, production, product, produce, or produce. Right, so I use the same spelling for an allomorph, even though I pronounce it very differently. So there's an allomorph apostle, um, basically here, and I might pronounce it very differently with different vowels, apostolic. So here it's a, pa, a, a. Here it's a, a. And here it's a, a, also. And in these ones I pronounce the T, and these I don't. So it turns out English spelling, as bad as it is, does often have a certain kind of logic, that we spell a morpheme the same way, even though its pronunciation may be different. So we have morphemic writing system. We want one spelling per morpheme. So even though allomorphy might mean that I would be using different phonemes to say it, we try to write it the same way. So that bomb always looks like B-O-M-B, even though I don't ever pronounce that B in bomb, I could get away with spelling it B-O-M, but because that B does start to get pronounced in other words that are in the same lemma, like bombard or bombardment or bombardier, then I keep that B spelled in all of the other words so that I can see that there's a visual relationship between this word bomb and the word bombard, or between the word produce with a S and productive or product with a K. Um, and it turns out very interestingly when they hook up English-speaking brains versus Mandarin-speaking brains, versus Spanish-speaking brains, the Spanish writing system is pretty faithful. Uh, learners of Spanish um, who learn to read can really figure out how to pronounce a word by just looking sound by sound, letter by letter. And an English-speaking an English -speaking learner can't. A word like city, you can't predict how this is going to be spelled because the letter C has many pronunciations, the letter I has many pronunciations, the letter T has many pronunciations, the letter Y has many pronunciations. Um, same thing with river. I have no idea. I just have to learn it as a whole. I can't really break it up into its parts very reliably. It turns out that English-speaking brains read much more similar to Mandarin brains. This is the Mandarin character for the morpheme, which means city. This is the Mandarin character for the morpheme, which means river. So a Chinese speaker would learn to read morpheme by morpheme. They have one symbol per morpheme. And it turns out, just as I said, English writes morpheme by morpheme. An English speaker learns to see this whole string at once as a single morpheme, much more similar to a Chinese character, rather than a Spanish speaker, which is learning to read letter by letter and sound by sound, because the sound system is reliable. So this has consequences. Um, just for how we teach, we want to teach words with the spelling kind of, or the pronunciation taught across the entire word, rather than maybe leaning learners to think about pronouncing them sound by sound, when that's going to get them in trouble more often than not.